Welcome to session four of improving student engagement in the science classroom using a driving question board. Um, we want to thank you all so much for joining this session and for sticking with us through this webinar series. It's been a really great learning experience for both Amanda and myself, and um, we have just been able to uh, learn so much from sharing this with you. And um, we've learned a lot from um, engaging with participants in this to see like how we might um, be able to change our module um, just in order to make it better. And so we really appreciate it. Um, in just a moment, when Amanda gets back to her space, she'll be there in just a moment. She's going to be um, dropping the link to the agenda for this session in the chat. Um, and we want just to continue to let you know, as always, that if you, um, Amanda is sending out the links to all of the videos, and so you're able to access those as you need them. And if you've missed a session, we do encourage you to go back to those videos and um, to catch up on your learning from there. Um, by now, you know who we are, so we're not gonna introduce ourselves, but we'll go on um, to our module goals. So our module goals for this evening and, um, the, we're going to take a moment and read these module goals, um, and I'm not going to take some time to, to read these to you, but I'm just going to pause and let you read them for yourself. So the module goal that we're going to focus on this evening is the last one where it is uh, bolded and it says to generate ideas for how a driving question board can be used as a formative assessment tool. So that's what we're going to be focused on this evening. And so before we begin jumping in, um, these are the norms that we have shared from previous sessions. Thinking about these norms that our learning community has developed together, I want us to discuss some of the impacts that norms can have on the community of learners. And you, um, hopefully you have seen some positive impacts of the norms. And so um, I want us to think about these two questions. How have these norms, first of all, supported our learning community? And then the second one, how might these norms support students in the development and use of the driving question board? Because that's what this learning has been centered around. So I wanna just open up the floor and allow you uh, to either unmute and kind of share your ideas about how these norms have supported our learning community. You're welcome to either type your response in the chat or once again, just to unmute and share. I like um, I like the fourth one, be open to productive struggle, um, because when we're learning something new, um, sometimes we get extremely frustrated, but I like that one in there because then I'm like, okay, it's productive, it's productive. <laughs> so it's like a reminder. Yeah, good. We were also talking um, a little bit earlier in another conversation of how um, Part of that productive struggle is that we're not always going to be right and it's okay not to be right and that's that's where we learn the most is in those um you know times that we aren't right and don't have all of the right answers and and just being open to that struggle as we do grow and learn from one another anybody else want to share how have these norms supported our learning community I will say one of the things that I've really appreciated about the group um, specifically is that um, you all have been very open to share and been open to be vulnerable to learn. And I think part of that comes from um, you all are open to new ideas 
and um, you know, you all are very respectful to one another. And um, so all of those things I think have helped support our learning community in a really meaningful way. And we really appreciate it. So the second question is how might these norms support students? in the development and the use of the driving question board. So engaging your students in, in um, group norms, how might that impact the classroom? I, I think they're really good at asking questions. And so that provides them with an opportunity to um, ask questions that might otherwise be a little bit off the wall. So at that point, there's no question that's really uh, too far-fetched at the beginning. Yes, thank you, Julie. I appreciate that. Students are full of questions. If we don't stifle and, you know, um, stifle their curiosity, so very important. Anybody else? I think that it gives the uh, freedom for all learners to be able to participate. Uh, you know, in a regular classroom, you'll have those that will sit there and and will never raise their hands and and ask questions. Um, and I think setting these group norms and letting know that it's safe for everybody uh, enables all the students to participate. Absolutely. I love that you pulled that one out because that also attends to the equity that we're really trying to to aim for specifically with the driving question board um, for all students voices to be heard and for everyone to have a chance uh, to learn and grow. So I appreciate that so much. Um, right, so let's move forward tonight. So um, again, session D is about why should the driving question board uh, be used as a formative assessment tool um, let's see, to uh, foster an equitable learning community. So tonight we're gonna be really diving in to formative assessment and how the driving question board can really um, help teachers in that formative assessment cycle. So before we move on, I want us to take a moment and you can either glance back through your notes that you have already um, taken throughout the first three sessions, or you can kind of take a mental journey um, back through these uh, webinars that you have attended and reflect on the learning that you've had so far. And I'm gonna leave these questions up on the screen to kind of jog your memory as to where we have been in this learning journey. And so I want you to think, what are specifically some things that have really resonated with you throughout this module that you would like to lift up to the group? So I'm going to just pause for a moment and then I'll invite you to share. Um, I like the last session with the driving question board um, in conjunction with the phenomenon. And that's a great way to start a unit and get the kids interested. And I, I think if we can get them interested at the beginning, um, that goes a long way to keeping them interested, especially with the phenomenon at the beginning. And then you're you're constantly going back to the driving question board to answer the questions. And the questions are not our questions; they're the kids' questions. So it it's a nice it's a nice way to include everyone and let them pursue science information that they want to know. Absolutely, and a beautiful way for them to take ownership of the learning because, like you said, it is all about the questions that they had. And um, so really for them to take the responsibility in that learning. Thank you, Tara. Anybody else? I would like to uh, piggyback on what Tara said. Um, I never used one before in conjunction with a really cohesive storyline. And this is the first unit that we have. And um, it, it just really flowed well using that driving question board and then having the student investigations answer some of those questions and then to culminate it with a 
a project and then revisit it at the end. It just, it just really made the lessons flow and connect with one another. So hopefully they'll understand it better. Yeah. Um, so far, Julie, how have the students responded to that? Oh, they, well, they've liked it. They've liked that their questions were on the board, um, that we answered their questions. And I think we, we hit on it last time that you've already, we've already come up with uh, activities, lessons, labs that we have in the back that we've already pre-planned. And it just, you know, coincidentally, the students' questions uh, match up with those. Mm -hmm. So they don't know that we've, it's already made, you know, we've already had an idea in mind and their ideas, they think it's their ideas, but it's not necessarily, <laughs> but that's okay. Right, absolutely. Absolutely, love that. Anybody else wanna share? I really think it's rewarding. I'm, I'm just going to say it's rewarding as a teacher, too, at the end of the lesson, whenever they're pointing out those questions that they had at the beginning and they can actually answer those, you know, really fully answer. And they actually know what all those mean. And they're so proud when you put that check mark on those post-it notes. And so am I. Absolutely. And like, I'm sure they get so excited over it. Like you said, they just love putting that question mark because um, they've seen that whole process come to light and the question that I had, I was able to answer with what I did in my classroom. So really great. All right. So um, just to kind of review the things that we have learned so far, uh, we, I'm going to, we want to examine this concept map that we've created to review those key ideas from the previous sessions. So we know that, um, starting at the bottom left, that it captures the students' wonderings and ideas to figure out a phenomenon. It builds a culture of appreciation and it values the diverse ideas of all students in your classroom. The driving question board also requires a series of investigations that is done over a period of time. It's that class's shared mission of learning. It's the roadmap and it engages and motivates the students to want to learn because they are excited, like Beth was saying, to answer their own questions. And then lastly, it provides that anchor to build that cohesive storyline like Tara and Julie were both sharing out with the group. So thank you all so much for going through that. All right, um, from the last session, um, we have always taken some small actionable steps that we can consider when implementing the driving question board into our classrooms. Last session, we took a moment at the end of the session to complete a stoplight reflection where you, we asked you to consider things that you might want to stop based on that session, but also what are some things that you think you need to start and begin to do in the classroom? And we looked back at that reflection and we just thought it was so powerful um, that we wanted to just really lift this up in the beginning of this session to think about all, all these things that we want to stop. Navigating the unit lessons without connecting it to a real phenomenon. You all said you wanted to stop leading the students with my own questions as the teacher. You want to stop not even anchoring the learning in an, in a phenomenon. You want to stop prompting all paths of questioning. And you want to stop, and I love this one, stop doing the thinking for the students. And I do think that that is key. But on the positive side, you all said, okay, based on this session, we want to start using students' questions for subsequent investigations in the unit. We want to start kicking off that unit with a phenomenon that can be used to navigate the direction of the lessons and the investigations. We want to start letting students ask their own questions and following where our students lead. We want to start visiting the driving question board more often during a unit, not just start with it and forget about it, but continue that visiting all throughout. And then we want to start being more intentional about focus questions that we um, frame our driving question board around. So we really, really appreciate your all's thoughts on that and um, just thought it was a great place to um, to highlight those. 
And um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you. It is so powerful to hear the shifts in your thinking and what you're advocating for your classroom and what you're working towards as making those shifts happen in your classroom. So tonight we're going to be focusing on the formative assessment piece of the driving question board. And our question for tonight is how can the driving question board be used as a formative assessment tool to foster an equitable learning community? And I'm gonna drop in the chat one more time our participant packet if you did not have a chance to print that off or if you need a quick link to be able to pull that up, that'll be a place where you can record some of your thinking tonight that you wanna make sure that you hang on to and continue reflecting on as we go throughout our session. Turns out our brains are wired to favor a communal view of the world. Humans have always sought to be in a community with each other. Collective science, uh, societies emphasize relationships interdependence within a community and cooperative learning. The driving question board shifts the classroom culture to focus more on the learning community of the we and positions every student as a knower while allowing them to take ownership of their learning. So tonight we're going to look at two STEM teaching tools that are on the screen. And this will hopefully allow us to understand more about the collective approach of positioning the student as the knower in the science classroom. So at this time, I'm going to invite you to navigate to those particular STEM teaching tools. STEM 47 is being dropped in the chat right now. STEM 57 or 54, I'm sorry, is being dropped in the chat right now. So whether you printed those off or you want to pull them up from the site, please go ahead and navigate to that spot. Now, as you are getting yourself situated and accessing those links, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a moment to read these one pagers from these STEM teaching tools to try to examine this idea a little bit more closely. And we're going to, in just a moment, be entering into breakout rooms for this reading activity. And what I'm gonna invite you to do is as we enter into the rooms, you're gonna be entering in with a partner. So each one of you will divide up the STEM teaching tools. One person read one while the other person reads the other. And it's going to be beneficial, though, for you to have access to both because we're going to invite you into a discussion and you may want to reference the STEM teaching tool that you uh, selected to read and call out specific key pass passages or selections um, with your partner during that discussion. So as we read the one pagers from the previous slide, we're going to make note of our responses to the following questions in your Session D notes section of your participant packet. And we want you to be ready to discuss these questions with your partner in the breakout room before we come back as a whole group and have a whole group discussion. So let me just pause for a moment and I want to give you time to read these four questions that are on the screen. Feel free to underline or highlight some keywords that you're noticing as you're reading through those questions. So you can kind of get in your mind what are some of the things that you're going to be looking for as you read. Thank you for that time in our community to just read and have a moment to reflect before we engage in our whole group um, discussion. So I would like to just take some time for us to call out some of the things that you shared with your partner or you maybe was able to note when you were doing your individual reading. And so we'll just kind of go down through each of the questions, beginning with from your reading and thinking about the driving question board, how could the driving question board help ensure all student ideas, questions, 
perspectives are shared and heard. Who might be willing to unmute and, and share with us? Um, I guess all students get to uh, have a voice and that their questions are heard and they're all visible. Like they get to see that posted or whatever up during the whole unit. So they might feel valued. Wonderful. Who would like to add on to that idea or offer oh. a new uh, thought from what they read? Oh, just to add on to Julie, it's just that while you have it up there, throughout the unit, if it hasn't been addressed, I think it kind of keeps those students engaged, waiting, when will, you know, when will my time come, even if there's three or four that have the same questions. So mm, it can, can you increase speak, student engagement. Can you speak a little bit more about how sometimes students might find that they have common questions with others? Would you talk a little bit more about that? Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think, yeah, I just think some, I, some students are very hesitant to speak um, or, you know, to say out loud. They just don't like to speak out loud, but I think it gives them a certain amount of confidence when they see, oh, somebody else has thought the same thing that I do. And when they look down, I read my article about some of the students who are uh, may have a, a stronger intellectual support at home or they're considered the science expert, they might realize, oh, I have the same question or I thought have the same thought that person has and it gives them that level of validation. So maybe it might foster some confidence to be more vocal in the future. It's wonderful. So I hear you also attending to like really leveraging expertise from all the students and not just sometimes the ones that students might identify amongst themselves but really uh, helping to provide an opportunity that all students see themselves as scientists and all mm -hmm. students' ideas and questions are in a place that's valued within the community. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's great that you elevated that thinking. Let's move on to the next question. Why is an equitable classroom community really essential when we start thinking about using a driving question board in our science classrooms? Who would like to unmute and begin? So thinking about equitable community and implementing our driving question board. How is why is this important? If you don't have an equitable classroom community, then somebody will overpower and you've got to have that ability for everybody to have a voice and as long as everybody's in an equitable feeling then they know they can speak up and they don't have to worry about being told that their idea is stupid or dumb mm -hmm. and you know as long as you know if they feel like they've got a voice they're going to speak up and so this builds confidence in them and that may be the reason why we've got to do it. Would anyone like to add on to that thinking about the classroom community that she is speaking on that's happening within the classroom while you're using the driving question board? And how students are treating one another. Would anyone else like to add on to that thinking? Um, I can very briefly. Um, I think it could that confident and ready to learn and ability to have discourse with one another can be transferred outside of the classroom into other settings or into other classrooms, um, which makes them a better learning all around, a learner all around. Would anyone be willing to speak a little bit more about that transfer to other settings? Did anyone else note um, of how what happens and being able to make connections? as she was sharing. Seems like sometimes if we let the kids um, have discussions with each other, they may spark, I don't know, friendship, uh, mutual respect, and then they carry that to other classrooms. Thank you. Are there any other thoughts out there?
it was like really those words respect and students really being able to value one another, their ideas and their questions. And it just also made me think there was a line in there that stood out about fostering trust and caring relationships. You were kind of talking about building those friendships, building those relationships, and it carries over. And so not only are we thinking about bridging from one subject to another, but I think also the key thing about a driving question board is we're bridging the learner's experiences in their own life into the classroom, that we're valuing the cultures and experiences of each individual student into a space where they feel that there are people ready to hear them and people ready to have them offer their science ideas based on their experiences and trying to make sense of whatever anchoring phenomenon that we use. So we're also just bri bridging that learning between the schools and students' everyday lives. And that's really important for us within the science classroom. And so we build a community not only within our classroom, but we're really starting to teach students about how we're building a community and teaching them how the enterprise of science work and how scientists really work together outside of the classroom. So as we move on, how might you use the driving question board as an opportunity to build areas of agreement and respectfully having disagreements? What were some things that you may have noted or thought about when uh, with resonating with you on this question? Well, I was reading through the article and there was a couple of um, words in there that I thought were really important and I wrote them down. Respectfully considering someone else's idea is an important life skill and that's true. Um, so whether you agree with them or disagree with them, that's OK either way um, because you're not going to agree with everyone you come across. So even in a science classroom, we can disagree with someone's the kids can disagree with someone else's idea and that's okay. As yeah. long as they're respectful about it. <laughs> well, and this is a place where we learned how to respectfully, I heard you say, be able to have conversation where we are disagreeing and being able to converse about that. Would anyone else like to add on to that idea of setting the stage where this, this can happen in the classroom and what that might look like? How do you think using the driving question board helps us to do that? How can we leverage the driving question board to challenge students to not just agree with what everything is said in the classroom, but really intellectually think about where we might not align and be able to speak that um, safely in our rooms with the science ideas that they currently know? I okay, feel that. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I think that students can uh, use what they already know and then what they're researching to support their opinions or their explanations and, and to be able to consider someone else's and then together. Uh, it, they may not come to a consensus, but maybe they can form new ideas bouncing off of each other. I love that. I heard you say they may not come to an actual consensus, but they're working on those ideas that they're trying to form together. So they're really listening to one another. They're really engaged in discourse. And using that driving question board, I still remember back in, in our uh, second session when you guys were engaged in the driving question board and you were like, I hadn't thought about that question or I hadn't thought about making that connection to this phenomenon. So it really opened up your ideas of other considerations. And one of the things that you can do, we talk a lot about coming back to that driving question board often. It's not just something we put at the beginning of an anchoring phenomenon and it sits there and collects dust. That we actively engage back into this driving question board multiple times as we're trying to make sense of the phenomenon. And as you do that, one key leverage that you can as a facilitator make in not only how you group those questions together, but you're providing opportunity for new questions to come up on that board. So as you're making uh, sense of the phenomenon, there might be new questions and new groupings of question that comes up there. 
but also the questions that you've answered. In what ways could you capture the claims, the answers to those questions, evidence that supports the answer, the science ideas behind the answer to the questions that you guys do create in the classroom. So I think also not only thinking through the facilitation of collecting the questions, organizing them and coming back, but also thinking through of how can you collect the answers and the evidence from the investigations, from the learning experience opportunities that students have, how can you collect those to also visually place in the room alongside that driving question board for students to decide, you know, I may want to change my mind based on the evidence that we've collected in this class. I may want to consider a new idea that I wasn't thinking or now because of this, I have a new question that's revolving around this phenomenon. So I think facilitators, facilitators really model in the way of how we agree and disagree. And sometimes the prompting and questions that we give in the classroom can really help to facilitate this and support students. And lastly, how might you differentiate the driving question board to meet the needs of all students in your classroom? Was there any thoughts that resonated with you as you read that you decided to note down or share with your partner? What stood out? So how are we meeting all the needs in the classroom by using a driving question board? Um, everyone comes to the table with their own um, ideas, their own uh, learning experiences. So um, we don't always we do, we're not all there with the same ideas, but we can share. So it uh, it allows each person to express themselves in different ways with their ideas. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to build upon that? Uh, the reading had a little interesting blurb. Um, it allows students to explore areas of uncertainty. So, I mean, the whole point of doing this is that they're learning, possibly learning about something that they don't know about yet. So they're 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 all on the same page. It's new information. Um, so they're all on the same page. They're all in the same boat, which is good for them. Right. So like they're starting to have a culminating activity together, like as a classroom, they're collectively exploring and trying to make sense of this mm -hmm. phenomenon. So they're engaged in this together. So I can bring my outside experiences in, but now we have a common experience that we are engaging in together and we're talking together and we're getting to elicit information from each other's students learning experience and we validate. We I think we also validate in this moment when we have a student who might, you know, persist in questioning, like, are you sure? Or, you know, really being vulnerable in their thinking and questioning what's happening in the classroom and the evidence. You can even bring to light scientists and scientist stories um, who work through this same um, possibility of we may not all agree. And how do we navigate all these needs? Because we might be getting it, but we may have a scientist who still is struggling and seeing it and needs that validation and needs that time given to, can, to keep working through their, their ideas. So um, I really appreciate the discussion and the time in this. And I'd like to begin moving into you actually now thinking about the word formative assessment. OK, so I'm going to drop the link to a fig jam in the chat and I'm going to ask you to just take a moment. And begin thinking about uh, your personal definition, and so you can select a post and note or um, one of the shapes at the bottom. And I want you to try not to look at what everybody else is writing. I just still want you to kind of just be in the alone zone and, and be in your own thinking and using your own words. How would you describe formative assessment? So just take a moment, 
and jot down some initial thoughts. All right, I'm going to invite you to take those blinders off and just take a moment and look across at a few of the other notes that were captured. And you might think, oh, that resonates with me. Might be something that you hadn't considered in your initial thoughts. And I'm just going to pause while you just have a moment of self-reflection as you look at some other thinking that's happening in the group. You might begin starting to see a pattern within our thinking. Would anyone be willing to unmute and tell me something that you might notice within our group's thinking? That's wrapped around formative assessment. Um. I couldn't get the fig jam to load. So what it made me think of is that with the formative assessment, you're looking to see how far the student has gotten in learning the concept. And, you know, one of the things I want the students to be comfortable with is like they said back. Some session I've been to where it's a good day to be wrong. And that way I can see, is there a misconception that needs addressing? Um, or, you know, another, you know, what's the evidence you have to support that? Just, that's where I am. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I had just taken a moment and captured a little bit of your thinking. Thank you for unmuting and sharing out. Anybody else note something that from the collection of thoughts they'd be willing to call out and share? Any patterns that you notice? OK, I don't know about the pattern, but Julie's genius in her little note says, and I didn't think about this, so this is was a light bulb for me. It's not only identifies student individual strengths and weaknesses, but instructional strengths and weaknesses, too. I like that one. The instructional strengths and weaknesses, because I don't know everything. Can you tell me a little bit more about why that resonates with you even beyond like your own personal knowledge that you might feel like you have in that content? Well, we all think that we're right in our own eyes and we're doing a great job, but if the kids don't comprehend what we're saying, then the problem is with us. Um, maybe we need to bring it down to their level or change our wording or it, we're, we're not only teachers, we're students as well. So are we getting across what we need to get across to them and a formative assessment would tell us that so what i'm hearing you say is based on what they're learning you might consider instructional shifts of changing to strengthen their ideas to moving forward if you don't see evidence of that am i saying that correctly yes all right thank you any others I hear, I see some things too. It's like at a moment, like in that moment um, that kind of resonates with our group too. So these are things that are happening ongoing within that content. Let's take a moment to look at a potential shared uh, definition. This, poten this definition actually comes from the Council of Chief State School Officers. And they have defined formative assessment as a planned ongoing process used by all students and teachers during learning and teaching to elicit and use evidence of student learning to improve student understanding of intended disciplinary learning outcomes and support students to become self-directed learners. So I'm going to pause. You may want to read that again. And can you drop in the chat what keywords jump out to you in this definition? If you'll open up your chat, 
drop in. What are some keywords that jump out to you? Okay, so I'm seeing self-directed learner, planned and ongoing, improving student learning, evidence, um, self-director, that has come up a lot. Would anyone be willing to unmute and talk a little bit more about why self-directed learner stands out to you? That's kind of a popular one. Does that surprise you in the definition? Does it make you think of something that you hadn't considered? Um, who would like to share? I think with a self-directed learner is that they maybe develop some curiosity to answer the question themselves. And when they get the feedback, they can, whether it's from an assessment, like Julie said, that would give them evidence of their learning and understanding, then they can figure out, well, why isn't that right? Or why is that right? And that's, their piece of it as opposed to me the teacher saying, this is what you need to know it's more like what do i want to know mm. I, don't, I don't know if i said that right yeah no and sandra i think is even adding on to your thinking by saying you know that's a goal to enable students to become self-directed learners we want them to take that initiative we want them to have the ownership of their learning um, do we see any alignment from this definition to the to our current thinking that we had? Do we see any places that we align to this definition? I think one word that really resonates with me is that word ongoing. Um, you guys had used uh, some of the words as we monitor. We we keep on coming back to it to see if they are if they have lapses in their understanding to see where they're at in their understanding. I think it's interesting though because a lot of our words revolved around what the teacher was doing, and this uh, definition also offers us to think about the role that students play in that formative assessment and the ownership that they have in that as well. So as we dive in a little bit more about formative assessment, we're going to look at one last STEM teaching tool. It is STEM teaching tool 16. It is going to be dropped in the chat as we navigate to that. And Sandra said instruction is developed and revised as we go throughout the set assessment as a as a common theme. A connection to this definition. Mm -hmm. So as we're, as we're navigating and finding this, this tool, there's two questions that we're going to really think about as we read. So formative assessment um, refers to uh, assessment for learning rather than the assessment of the learning, allowing teachers to use knowledge of students' understanding to inform their ongoing instruction. And I think someone even mentioned that just a moment ago. And that Formative assessments can fall on the continuum from formal to informal. So informal formative assessment is defined as ongoing strategies that help teachers acquire information from students that can immediately be used in instruction. And that was something that you guys kind of elevate that you felt that was really important. So let's take a moment to read this brief around informal assessment cycle as a model for teacher practice. So let me pause and let you read. And as you read, there's a place in your participant note to note anything that you could pull from the reading that could help us answer these two questions. So as we're thinking about formative assessment and we think about this informal formative assessment, how could we then use the driving question board to give voice to all students in an informal assessment? And then how are we going to have to, what do we have to get, keep in mind as supports that teachers need in order to enact this kind of robust informal assessment in their classroom? So the first one's talking about student voice. The second question is focused on what do the teachers need in order to do this? Let me pause. I'm going to give you about six minutes to read and then I'll check in. Feel free to turn off your cameras as you read. I'll turn off mine and then I'll turn back on and check in with you in six minutes. All right, 
as we're preparing our thoughts, let's kind of finalize what we're ready to share. Again, turning back on our cameras, inviting everyone back into our community. And let's begin, first of all, thinking about the students. How, what, how might we use the driving question board to give voice to all students in an informal assessment? Who would like to start? We can see what other questions that they're, they've come up with and add those to the board or see what questions have been answered satisfactorily and manipulate those. I love that. And in that way, it really gives students a chance to get some meaningful feedback and kind of that low stake environment which supports their learning, helping them develop their confidence, their ability to express themselves. I see Sandra has put students can post their evidence to support or change their questions. Oh, is there anyone who would like to add on to that? Changing their questions, changing their ideas, having evidence for that change. Does that spark any other thoughts in someone? I, I like that the, um, the, the it's evidence driven um, so that students feel that it's OK to change their answers because the evidence supports their um, new ideas or their original ideas, depending on what it might be. Um, it encourages that thought process. Yeah, revisiting the driving question board often, it really does give the students an opportunity to answer the questions, maybe even elaborate on their responses. They may have to uh, explain more or engage in argumentation as they're trying to make sense of the phenomenon. And so the driving question board can really reveal the thinking of the students in that moment of time and providing the teacher with information about the initial and growing ideas that the students have towards that phenomenon. So how, how can we support teachers? What do we need to do to be able to have teachers enact this robust informal formal of assessment in their classrooms? What were some things that stood out to you? teachers have to to work on and be able to do. Teachers need to be able to use the students ideas to guide conversation. Mm hmm. In real time. Yeah, this isn't like happening afterwards at the end of the day and you're collecting. It's happening in real time. So that way, as teachers develop those listening skills, then they're able to change the way that they question in that moment to begin either eliciting more ideas or probing student ideas. And even challenging student ideas. So in the moment, Teachers are adjusting their questions based on what they're hearing in that discussion of what's happening with that driving question board and trying to make sense of the phenomenon. What else do we have to support teachers in being able to do this? Sometimes you got to go off the rails. You're not you going to necessarily be on your curriculum map. It's you may be going off the rails here. So can you tell me a little bit more about that in uh, maybe even connecting it back to the story of the phenomenon. Is there any connection that you see in that? You can, you may be going into something that's not even in what you're, you know, if you're teaching chemistry, it could go into biology or it could go into earth science. You may be going into an entirely different discipline than what you're looking at, but it, that's where the kids questions go that's where the kids questions go and so you're going to have to maybe make it a uh, little jaunt in down the rabbit hole to cover what needs to be covered 
It makes me that's such a nice point that you have elevated for us because it makes me think back to our last session where we looked at the storyline and then we saw the big long list of performance expectations that that storyline involved in in students making sense of. And I, I think it's nice that you point out that it's these these particular experiences are not just like your one two day experiences. You really engage students over a period of time to dig deep into their understanding of the science ideas. And what I'm hearing you say is also across disciplines. So we're not just elevating and focusing on one performance expectation within our Kentucky academic standards, but we're looking at a bundle of performance expectations and they may not all live in life science or earth science or physical or engineering that we might see representations of one or more within that bundle that students have to apply and use to make sense and we see relevant we see relevance in that in the types of questions that they are asking did i paraphrase that okay or is there anything yes. else that you may want to add on to that that's on just right yeah, Amanda, do you care if I just say oh, something please. about Nancy's comment? I just I just wanted to add on to what she was she was saying um, about going down those rabbit holes. And I think that also gives us a clue as some support that teachers might need, because we know that as teachers, we might not be able to go down every single rabbit hole that our students want us to go down. And so um, knowing how to navigate the students questions in a way that still gets to where we want them to go, I think is is a support that teachers might need in that process. Does that make sense? You might be able yes. to say that better than me. <laughs> right, and the driving question board allows a place for ideas to go, and we've talked about this before, questions to go on the board, but it may not be the right time to answer them, but you still honor that thinking and those questions that they have as scientists and then you can find opportunities and ways to still build upon or give them opportunities to build upon their ideas to answer those questions they that may not fit in the uh, storyline which kind of leads me to also say because we just kind of did this together and even modeling it for you guys is that the teacher the facilitator repeats and revoices the student responses. So even in our conversations tonight, hopefully you've seen us even model that as we've been working and, and discussing together um, of repeating and revoicing um, the answers that are that are present, the thinking that's present within our group. I want to pause and see if there's anything else that stands out before we move on. This has been great discussion. All right, so it really calls again to the cycle of the teachers eliciting a response, the student response, the teacher has to recognize that student response and then use it. And so that is happening in the moment uh, within the classroom between the student and the teachers. So as we think about taking all of this information um, on the screen you're now going to see a graphic that was developed by the kentucky department of education on the formative assessment process and i'm going to ask you to open that chat and invite you to answer there as you examine this graphic um, i want you to think about how might the driving question board support the formative assessment process as described in the graphic and so you might end up wanting to take one of these questions, like where am I going? Where am I now? Where to next? And, and or you might think of a collective thought. So let me just pause. I'm gonna give you one minute to just type what kind of resonates as we think about using the Kentucky Department of Education formative assessment process. How can the driving question board um, be linked to this, to this uh, image? So talking about that this is an ongoing cycle, so really focusing on those arrows and that it's a movement between students and teachers. So we're elevating not just our teachers as in our initial definition, but we're really starting to think about how students take ownership of also that assessment and the feedback that they're getting from it.
that the driving question board is evidence of the student's learning. Documenting, it's a documentation that students' ideas are growing and changing, that they're making sense of that phenomenon. It helps to guide the individual learning and they see it as a journey and there's a process to start with and there's support in that journey. I kind of even called out the where am I now? Like I get moments to, to stop as a learner and as a teacher and think, what have I learned so far? What, where am I going? What new questions might I have? So it's, it gives it, us a chance to reflect on our thinking as we're trying to make sense. These are wonderful. So thinking back to our uh, question, we also introduced this particular support that is given to you as you go back into your classroom and as you share this with other educators at your school or within your district. And this graphic is another entry point, not only the one that we just showed you from KDE, but this one helps you to see the elements that are essential, the, those essential components, excuse me, to consider when you're implementing the driving question board. So again, this is just another nice graphic as you uh, move beyond our session tonight and you go back into your classroom is a support system of things that you can think about when you when you talk about informative assessments and making sure that these components are reflective um, in your implementation. So let's just take a moment and let's think about our experience um, in your session D notes. I'm just going to give you a minute or two of what is something that has stood out to you tonight that you want to capture around how the driving question board can be used as a formative assessment tool to foster an equitable learning community. What do you want to capture that you you don't want to forget? It could be leaning back into one of the STEM teaching tools. It could be something in a change in mind or something that you acknowledge that you grew in your thinking that you just want to note and you don't want to forget. And you'll have more time to reflect. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick chance to just jot down something, but I really want us to take just a few moments because we understand that as you're implementing the driving question board, there may be barriers that you have to overcome in the implementation process. And I know that many of you guys have been working on your plan. Several of you guys have already started the implementation process. So we just want to call out a few things about um, barriers that we have seen and worked with teachers in order to overcome when implementing a driving question board. The slide deck will also be available to you. We will send that out through email. So don't feel pressure that if you can't get um, all of these things noted down that you will be able to uh, get the PowerPoint and come back and look at all the details of some ways that you can overcome the barriers. So one is management of time. How do I, I only have so much time to do this. Um, how can I manage it? So I think one of the things that you noted that we did um, and then we finished it up afterwards because we only had a set amount of time in our sessions that it's really important that the grouping of the questions happens with the students that we we don't want we want to encourage teachers not to wait till the end of the day and group them on their own we want that to be a collective process that students are involved in because you want the discussion on um Oh, I don't see the commonalities in that, or I think this could go here, or let's add another question or make this into another category. You want the students to be doing that thinking, not the teacher. So be intentional that in the times when you revisit the driving question board to check for the student learning. So when you think about that storyline, plan when are those good moments after um, learning experiences to go back and have those check ins. Because um, you won't find that you'll go to the driving question board every single day. Those need to be strategically planned multiple times within the full length of the story. And as you do that, um, make sure that you capture the science ideas visually 
that's coming out in their understanding of those driving questions. So that's a great time to elevate as you're going through the question. Here's the science idea that we understood and gained in order to answer that question and write that visually in a split in this in a space in the classroom that's that students can refer back to and see and add on to as they revisit the driving question board. So our next is management of space. So thinking about managing the space, especially for multiple classrooms, you can do it in a variety of ways. One is to color code your classrooms. Um, you can use like a trifold board or some kind of you. You guys saw us use technology, a technology platform to organize our driving question board. And you might be able to use some kind of flip charts. So ways that you could, you may not have enough wall space if you have multiple classes to keep them all up. So what are ways that you can house them um, and pull them back up during those times that you revisit? Are there any questions revolving time and space before we move on to a couple of other barriers that we've heard um, teachers share that kind of was a struggle for them in implementing it at first. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. So I think we talked a little bit about this just a minute ago that not all questions might be addressed at that time with that particular phenomenon in the storyline that has been built. So you can provide other spaces and times for students to continue researching and, and investigating those. Um, I think in elementary, my librarian was a great friend in allowing students to continue their thinking during that time, computer lab time. So think about strategically, who else could you collaborate with within your school to give students the support for that ongoing research and investigation? Also, communication to your parents and to the caregivers of the children are going to be a great way that you can consider um, opportunities at home for them to discuss it with their families. Make sure that they capture these questions down in their notebooks. Not only do they have to be housed in, in the classroom, but in their own student journal is a great place for them to have a place where they can continue collecting their own thoughts and questions. And so then you can kind of consider what other learning opportunities might fit within your schedule. And you're going to find that not all the questions are going to be great appropriate and aligned to your performance expectation that you're trying to meet. So you might have to navigate helping students reformulate their questions that would help lead to great appropriate investigations or think about other ways to use these questions to differentiate instruction to meet the diverse needs of all learners, especially during small group time. So I will just pause and see if there's any other questions. Hopefully some of those things will, maybe you've had that question and you think, oh, I may want to consider that and uh, dive into that a little bit more and see how I could apply that. Great. So our shared understandings from tonight's session, um, the driving question board can serve as an informal formative assessment in the classroom when a teacher elicits student thinking and makes immediate use. And it can provide students an opportunity to get meaningful feedback in a low stakes environment, which supports their learning and helps them develop confidence in their ability to express their understanding. And as we've shared tonight, it gives voice to all students in order to fully engage students in that inquiry based lesson and effectively implement informal formative assessment practices with them. And lastly, I hope that tonight it resonates with you that the driving question board can promote deep and equitable learning when planned purposefully to ensure the various perspectives that students bring to make sense of the phenomenon are solicited clarified and considered. All right, thank you, Amanda. And we thank you so much for being patient with us um, as we have continued on with this webinar this evening. And um, we want to um, just revisit our questions that we started this session with. Hopefully by the end of the session, now you can answer, how can the driving question board be used as a formative assessment tool? 
How can the driving question board be used to foster an equitable learning community? So we do have the next steps considerations for implementation and you all have the folder um, to be able to download your thoughts in whether you snap a picture or um, use a Google Doc and, and make sure that that is included in the folder. But we would like you to continue thinking about your next steps using the driving question board that hopefully you planned last session. Uh, with your students. Consider how you might identify the science ideas or the lack of ideas that the driving question board revealed. Revisit that driving question board frequently throughout the unit. How can you use the driving question board to formatively assess the students using that driving question board process? And then lastly, to elicit evidence that students were engaged in making sense of the science and the phenomenon within that unit. So now for the reflection, uh, we want to invite you to go back to the Fig Jam and Amanda can post that back in the chat for you. And I'm going to take a moment to switch gears back to that Fig Jam. And um, over here on the right of uh, the formative assessment, you will see uh, the, some social media pictures. And it also has a link to the driving question board module along with our Twitter handles. And what we'd like you to do is take a moment to think about uh, a key takeaway that you have from this driving question board module webinar experience that you have uh, participated in with us and um, post like you're posting a social media post and um, share your excitement with uh, this learning community. And we'll also invite you that if you feel that you would like to post this in a social media platform, we hope that you will do that and kind of advertise this resource uh, to others in the field and to your friends. And so we've provided um, our Twitter handles are now called X, um, but you have the KDE, you have my Twitter handle there in the Fig Jam, as well as Amanda's. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for your participation. Like Eric has said, thank you for the great work that you guys have done in building this community. Um, I look forward to hearing your success stories as you continue implementing the driving question boards into your classrooms and schools across our great state of Kentucky.